Okay, uh, now it's 1.50, so I'd like to uh, start the presentation. So uh, my name is Ichiro Fukuda from NTT Innovation Institute. Uh, today I'm gonna talk during a career uh, class NFP use cases. So uh, we have a, a co-presenter, uh, Pratik from Juniper Networks. Hello everyone, I, I'm Pratik. I lead some of the NFP initiatives at uh, Juniper. I'm the Contrail team. Okay, so uh, we'll go, uh, yep, so since we plan to do the live demo here, uh, so uh, we just wanted to move quickly to introduce the context and uh, directly dive into the uh, demo. So I'll skip this line. So uh, today uh, I, uh, we'd like to talk about uh, uh, ent enterprise WAN challenges at, uh, uh, in the beginning. So, uh, and then uh, we will show, share the NTT Group's uh, ESI solution, which incorporates SDN and NFP technology to bring up to the uh, carrier SDN, NFP services uh, to the enterprise. And then demo and move on to the uh, Q&A. Okay. So uh, first one, so this is a context of the Enterprise WAN overview. So today, as an NTT Innovation Institute, uh, we are running the Customer Experience Center, to start, uh, which is focused on like a R&D arm for the NTT group uh, to focus on uh, deliver the uh, global services to our uh, customers. And also we are running the Customer Experience Center to engage with the customer and grab the feedback and learn the thoughts for their challenges. So this is a slide that what we capture uh, during our customer engagement. So today, uh, enterprise customers' challenges, so that's five things. So one is the, uh, for the networking, uh, they struggle with overwhelming workload. They have too many devices to manage, especially like a retail uh, or like a large enterprise. So they do have like a, lots of CP devices, a lot of middle box to manage to make the uh, networking working. And also they have a problem with a slow network provisioning. So uh, most of the enterprise network, so still they do have like manual uh, provisioning processes. And having like a third one, operational insecurity. So uh, since like nowadays, like a security device, uh, network threat is like uh, uh, increasing, so that like it's very difficult for them to manage the security and keep it um, uh, keep keep it in secure. And fourth one, uh, they uh, have a lack of uh, visibility. Basically, like once they come to our carrier services, they have no clue on what's happening in the net network. So it's they have uh, uh, difficulties to troubleshoot on the visibility to, uh, and uh, understand what's happening in their enterprise system. And fifth one, also the compliance overhead. They do have their, uh, their own com uh, corporate compliances. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to manage, especially like large multinational company, uh, it's very difficult to manage their policy to make sure that um, uh, it's properly configured. So this is our observation uh, from our NTD group engagement. And second one, so this I pulled up the uh, Open Networking User Group, ONAG SD1 Working Group. It captures the same concept like what enterprise early adapter speakers are talking about the problem spaces of the uh, WAN for their enterprise. So uh, there's a re really high expectation for the soft, uh, to have a software-defined WAN for, uh, from the SD, uh, ONAG as well. So that, uh, so they say, so for instance, there's, look at the five. So they're claiming, uh, enterprise is claiming high cost and low control of the wide area network. So that means like a, to us, like a service pro provider, we need to give the low cost and high control WAN services. And also reduce the time for the provisioning cycles and have more efficient security or enforcement. So as an entity, like a service provider, what do we do? So we are seeing like a lot of, like a share of the customer wallet is shifting from carrier circuit, like a physical pipes, 
and going uh, and uh, selling network hardware as a network integration. It's going moving shifting to the more value added services uh, or ma managed services, so that we need to uh, we we like to capture this opportunity to bring the end to end solution uh, uh, by providing a co uh, converged IT inf uh, infrastructure as a services model. So uh, here's our solution. Uh, our solution calls Elastic Service Infrastructure, ESI. So ESI is in high level. We provide the service infrastructure of the SDN NFP enabled uh, programmable enterprise networking. So the concept is to distribute the NFBI over the multiple location. If you look at the diagram, so our orchestrator controller orchestrates, there's a three levels of at altitude. So cloud and fog and ground. So most of the uh, BCP use cases, kind of like everyone talks about having it virtualized function in the carrier services. But in our case, we like to distribute to the customer premises uh, as one uh, 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 distributed small nano cloud environment with the CPE devices. And also, uh, we are focusing to uh, open up the VNF marketplace to have like a, a VNF partners to pull, uh, put their uh, own VNF services uh, to the marketplace, and we provide the, uh, platform services to uh, provide those uh, multiple various VNF services from the marketplace, so that customer can choose their own preferred uh, brands or the uh, the vendors, and they can freely place their uh, net. Uh, appliances to with their appropriate topology, what they have. So the status of the ESI, so currently in the NTT group, we are in the internal uh, product evaluation phase, and I uh, hope uh, we'd like to move our uh, rollout to uh, uh, having customer, uh, customer to uh, test our beta services in this end of this year. So solution overview. So capturing those uh, significant um, interest from our enterprise customer. So the solution uh, incorporates, the like, customer needs flexible service chaining to have their uh, preferred devices function to be placed on, on demand. And also need a more uh, like a centralized management, like a pu pushing their uh, unified policy security control from the orchestrator or centralized con uh, con uh, controller. And we need a uh, third one, uh, we need the carry grade SDM platform to have those uh, uh, virtual network to connect all the uh, enterprise branches, including a cloud data center or their private data center. So uh, this is solution details, a bit uh, uh, small, uh, small uh, words, but I'll, I'd like to capture in the actual demo. So basically, what we'd like to do is, like we have today, uh, we, the, we have a CP here. So I'm going to uh, provide a live demo to, to add this room as one of the uh, enterprise branch office. So yeah, I, I'd like to capture this one, uh, solution details in later. So uh, go to the live demo. Our use case is the uh, enterprise, like one ESI captures like a lots of use cases. So, but this presentation, uh, we'd like to focus on having branch networking. How are we gonna roll out the branch more quickly? So, for instance, today's uh, in the adding the branch to the uh, in the today's network, we usually take six to eight weeks to bring up the net, uh, bring up the branches, and finish the, all the tunnel, the VPN configuration uh, to the rest of the sites. So, it's very time consuming. But uh, in this demo, so we'd like to have like more on-demand onboarding, self-onboarding to uh, the enterprise VPN. So this is a demo setup. So now I have a, a, a CP devices. We call Elastic Service Edge. We call this is ESE. So I have uh, my laptop connecting to the portal services, self-service uh, portal, and this device has orange cable as a management plane. To configure it, like a just do single uh, um, a simple onboarding uh, process, 
and I have a white cable as a LAN interface, which is connected to my laptop. And blue one is the WAN interface is connected to the uplink, uh, which this conference venue provides. So this is the ESI portal that uh, customers, like a, a customer admin, network admin will play with. So uh, this is the uh, to, uh, overview topology that has, so let's say these green box are the CP devices or you can understand this is like a VPN site. And you see the gray box, like a gray out box at the left top, that's the uh, Vanc Vancouver site that uh, what uh, we are trying to onboard today. The inner circle, these are the VPN. So since this is a SDN and F, uh, we are using SDN and NFB, so it's kind of like once you get into this LAN port, it's everything like a, you can understand as a one fabric, big fabric. So a customer can create their own network slices like a corporate for the business, uh, general corporate uh, access and like a business or innovation like having their own divisions closed network which is not connected to the internet and so on. So uh, we do have uh, kind of like a simplified data model for like a devices. I'm sorry, so session time. So this one, so this is a CP device management and we do have kind of virtual network here. So now uh, let's uh, go to the uh, uh, device onboarding. So customer can easily onboard, self-onboard to the VPN uh, by creating a token and associate a device to the uh, local here. So now I'm gonna copy the token here and switch to the device. So this is the web UI is the uh, onboard, uh, embedded web UI which is running on this CP device. I will associate a token so once uh, I associate a token uh, to here, so this device will uh, phone home cluster to get registered to the VPN. So back inside, so it's currently now it's device is authenticated by token, and it start like a controller uh, VPN controller running in the cloud side start configuring the uh, details tunnel between the, uh, each site uh, that need. Uh, uh, tunnel. So, uh, so in our case, so as so for that, we are using the underlay uh, overlay VPN, like a SSL VPN technology, as an underlay of the uh, virtual network. So we have, and then we put the network virtualization layer to have like more uh, on demand, like a flexible configure, uh, configurable network. So now it looks like we should have a tunnel up. So this is kind of like a, uh, uh, we have a connection established between the co uh, concentrator, which is like a controller cluster is running, and we do have like two peers with the, uh, another VPN site. So next, so uh, this is kind of like a providing overlay VPN, very similar to DMVPN or other uh, a solution uh, who creates a, a virtual network on the fly. So next one, so we can have, a uh, customer can create, come to the serv uh, ESI service catalog and choose their uh, preferred devices to push from the central place. So this is the ESI service catalog. So this is based on like a, a template. So these are our current uh, partners who are uh, who provides us the VNFs uh, and working together. So in this demo, I'd like to uh, bootstrap the uh, Fortinet firewall. So uh, we have a simple policy uh, here uh, when we uh, onboard the. Uh, Fortinet to this uh, uh, edge devices. So now I put some web filter policy for like a not to access NTT i3 website. 
And uh, so customer can simply deploy. So now what happened uh, uh, at this moment is, so this, uh, yeah, so this device starts uh, uh, connecting to the home cluster and check the VNF to be downloaded to this device. And the orchestrator will configure the, spin up the VM and configure, uh, configure the service instance from the central point. That, like, uh, you don't have to manually configure the network devices uh, at the local side. So this is the entry of the Fortinet firewall. Uh, it's currently, it takes some time to uh, bring all, all those functions up. So um, uh, I w I'd like to wait a couple minutes to spin up those VM to uh, make sure that's functional. So uh, while having, uh, like waiting for the VM, so I just, just wanted to derail uh, uh, to some like a technolog uh, uh, technology aspects. So uh, for this function, so you're seeing the uh, controller orchestrator uh, uh, the portal. So it's running the API services and giving the abstracted view of the data model. And as a control cluster, we are using, uh, at the data center side, we are using the OpenStack. And as a net, uh, SDM uh, layer, we are using the open control. And, and that global and local context, we have our own abstraction layer, and we put the heat layer uh, between the product APIs. So we can separate the service and the product or southbound APIs uh, cleanly. So uh, this is kind of like a, a, a more rapid service development framework that we do, uh, uh, we have. So uh, basically, in the most uh, existing uh, existing like a network uh, SDN uh, development, so we know that there's a uh, lots of benefits from the netconf. But in our case, uh, our framework has kind of like a, a defined based on the JSON and like write the service model abstraction model in the YAML file online, so that like it's extremely easy to define the own uh, service API or service abstraction layer. And we, we do have, uh, we, and then we manage the templates here uh, for the heat template, for instance. So that, like, it's kind of, uh, we assume, like, a more zero, co uh, zero coding service enablement uh, by using this framework. Why we do this, uh, uh, like a, we want to separate the abstraction lay, uh, level uh, and the service and the product. As a service provider, we do have like hundreds of OSS, BSS behind, right? So, so we usually like ask for the product vendors to modify their APIs or add attribute to the specific use cases. But it doesn't work. It takes some time and also product vendor want to uh, hesitate to uh, like uh, invade their own product model or the API model. So it's very important to have like a clear separation between the services and the standard or product APIs. So that like uh, we can like uh, have like a more rapid customization for the API, whatever our BU needs or customer needs. So this is kind of like an idea uh, uh, of the, what, how we put the orchestration layer on top. So uh, while talking, so uh, now we see the Fortinet firewall up and running. So you see some like a, uh, output from the heat stack that uh, VMs are correctly deployed on the edge side. So now I'd like to check the data plane, whether it's working. So uh, I will turn off the, uh, my uplink that is connected to the uh, portal or internet to make, sure, uh, you, uh, to make sure that I use this LAN port. <laughs> so check it on connectivity. So first, I'd like to go to the internet website uh, we are using a VPN. So this shows like uh, this packet goes through, uh, uh, come to this uh, port one, 
and it will go uh, use the tunnel, SSL tunnel to the remote site that is running this internet web server running. So next one, just to make, uh, I'd like to make sure that I, I can break out to the internet from local here. So next one is the, to access the Google. So now uh, you can see the Googling, it's working. So importance of this local internet breakout. So enterprise is seeing, like since current enterprise, mostly they aggregate or they have their own data center or internet breakout point at the hub site. But while you're seeing like a lot of like adoption to the SaaS services like Office 365, Salesforce, so they have like a latency issues uh, comes in. But the customer, so when they distribute the firewall or the uh, policies uh, enforcement endpoint, they have to deal with those uh, uh, inefficiency of the security. So uh, ESI will take care of this, like uh, having like a local uh, inter uh, breakout point to the, uh, at the local side, and also give the more centralized management policy distribution from the controller side. And finally, I'd like to go to check. I cannot go to my company website. So you see the uh, FortiGuard is, uh, web filter is functioning at this side. Uh, to uh, not to go uh, to allow the traffic to the uh, uh, yeah which 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 is filtered uh, by this firewall. So uh, this is a demo uh, what we have. Then go back to the presentation to recap the uh, 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 present uh, like a demo. So we are running the ESI controller at the global side. So we have a, a service a, a abstraction layer, and that's the based on the Go-based uh, API server. As you see, that like uh, having service, uh, rapid service development framework running. So we have the, uh, the abstraction model at the global side, and we do have kind of like a mapping layer, like a work, uh, worker mapping layer to uh, use the heat as an orchestration engine. Under the heat, there's a microservice control like a VPN controller to manage the SSL VPN, and the SDN controller as control as SDN controller, and use the OpenStack to spin up the VM in the data center side. So the important point is like we use OpenStack Nova in the data center side, but we don't use the uh, Nova compute at the edge side. It's kind of like a, uh, we uh, we simplify those. Um, uh, service instance spin up and like having uh, to have the KVM based VM and the Docker image. So we can spin up those service instance from the uh, switch agent directly to uh, have like a more lean uh, uh, compute environment at the remote side. This will help our more simplify and not to have those complexity, data center complexity bring into the enterprise edges. So this is our idea. So uh, yeah, so this is the high-level architecture uh, yeah, uh, that we have, and I'd like to switch to the open control part to Pratik. Sure, thanks, Sachiro san So uh, from the uh, control perspective, the network architecture is such that we have created a Neutron plugin, which exposes all the Neutron APIs. We also have uh, an extension uh, set of APIs, which enables things like service chaining and so on. And that's how the orchestrator, uh, whether in this case the Entity i3 or other OpenStack uh, orchestrators, can actually talk to the entire SDN environment. There is a there is a controller which is a logically centralized but physically distributed uh, set of nodes, and they talk BGP uh, east-west. That enables scale. Uh, south on the data plane side, there is a V router component, and one of the V router components is actually running on this box. Uh, so the, there is a vRouter component, which is a which is a data plane component, kernel loadable module, lightweight kernel loadable module, and essentially that is the one that takes directions from the controller and makes things happen. And the the things that it can make happen are things like you can create two virtual networks, and uh, essentially as you can see there are blue and green virtual networks. You can create them and you can assign uh, the whether bare metal servers or containers or virtual machines to each of them. 
and you can have policies between them. And those policies could be things where you can spin up a firewall, one of the ones uh, firewall we spin, spun up here. And you can say that any traffic from one virtual network to another goes through that particular firewall. So this enables you to do a central, centralized policy uh, definition and distributed policy enforcement. Um, there, again, as you can see, the, 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 um, the re-router can run on Linux boxes, which could be either a CP device or some x86 servers running on uh, in, within data centers or pops or what have you. And the con controller also talks to the top of rack switches uh, using, again, uh, standard protocols. So uh, as you can see, it uses OVSDB, which is, which is a standard protocol. And that's how it makes uh, bare metal part of a virtual network. So uh, the, the thing that I want to actually highlight here is that you know, it's a, it's a multi-vendor kind of an approach. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of loosely coupled components. And we can enable that because we use standard protocols, as I just mentioned. Uh, it, whether it, you're talking about uh, you know, different Linux uh, OSs or hypervisors, containers, whether you're talking about x86 servers or you know, CP devices, uh, whether you're talking about gateway, you need a gateway to terminate all the tunnels and go out to the internet. Uh, or you're talking about top of rack switches. We have enabled, uh, of course, uh, being part of Juniper, we have uh, interoperated with Juniper, QFX 5100, but also uh, you know, Cumulus and other white box switches, and also the con uh, orchestrator itself. So all in all, it, it provides you a set of loosely coupled components, but together it gives you a to integrated uh, environment. Um, and that makes it the solution multi-vendor, I think, something that service providers uh, like Entity and uh, some of you will appreciate quite a bit. Uh, in, in terms of the ESI solution specifically, we did it in a very co-creative, collaborative manner, as Ichirasan was uh, referring to earlier, where you know, there were engagements uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, there were engagements almost on a daily basis, sometimes from both sides, engineering side, as well as product management, as well as architect side. And it was more of a partner kind of a relationship than, uh, than a customer relationship. So, uh, and what that helped us do is it helped us you know, drive some of the product requirements. And some of the things like physical plus virtual interconnect, the, the use case that I was talking about where you can have bare metal servers as part of virtual networks, that was something that was actually driven by a requirement from, from Entity. There were other things like container. Containers, um, uh, that, that was, again, another thing that, that was driven by, by this particular engagement. Um, in terms of the, uh, again, the central, there is a central portal which, where, where you are uh, doing the provisioning of the CP devices. Uh, we had done a, uh, uh, of course, we had to enable that. So there, there, there also we had uh, a good amount of uh, collaboration uh, going on and product requirements being driven from, from this engagement. And the features that were used in this particular, uh, of course, the control features, existing control features that were used in this particular solution were service chaining, uh, where you can have probably multiple services, some of them running on the CP device, some of them running at the data center, chained together. Uh, then the, the whole concept of you, know, you define a policy centrally and have it enforced in a very distributed manner. And one of the distribution points is the CP device. So all, that is uh, something that is, that is key in Contrail that, uh, that, was, that was enabled by the solution. Of course, the vRouter itself running on the CP device is, uh, is, is, is vRouter itself. The functionalities of the vRouter was also something that was enabled. And we had a, a, a carrier grade uh, uh, platform. Because we cater to uh, telcos, we have to have a, a carrier grade platform, which is performant, um, whether you're talking about latency or uh, throughput or packets per second. It is performant. It is scalable, because it uses uh, scalable protocols like BGP, uh, both at the control plane level and at the data plane level. It is highly available. We have made all the components as, uh, as highly available. It is uh, the uh, security is one of the important things. Uh, we just saw one one example of uh, a centralized uh, security and uh, distributed enforcement. Interoperability is of course very key because as you can see on top of Contrail, we are running a 14-net firewall. So that actually tells you the interoperability nature of the of the solution. And analytics is uh, very important because. Uh, as you saw, as, uh, a lot of information from the CP device and from the data center is being passed back to the centralized um, admin. And that, there you can see what is actually going on in your branch, branch offices and data centers and so on. 
So that, that, is, that is what we have. Here is a press release that uh, we did. Uh, here is a URL where you can go and take a look at uh, the solution in more detail. Uh, uh, the, he, this, is, this is probably an example where we saw a customer having a, a particular problem, and that problem is probably uh, prevalent in, in, in the telco market. We saw a particular problem, and we solved it in a very co-creative and collaborative manner. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we'd like to conclude uh, um, our presentation. But uh, so we as a service provider, we are uh, very focused on having open source. It's very imp important to have us to have code inside and let us contribute to integrate uh, to bring, uh, develop our service provider, uh, service from the service provider. So as you see, so there's not, not only the open stack, but also control, and we have our own SSL components and the devices. So it needs a lot of work to integrate, to bring the, uh, deliver the product or services at the speed. So uh, it's very important and need, a, uh, as Pratik mentioned, uh, we need a very loosely coupled model for the modular architecture to have the uh, product development. So uh, we'd like to have uh, to um, hear back the, your uh, service provider, or if you have a VNF, we are very open to collaborate and discuss with how we can bring the NFB into the real business. So I'd like to open up the Q and A session. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, I have a two-part question. Um, one, uh, have you guys done any kind of scale testing, like uh, how many VCPs you could potentially host in this? Uh, in the solution, the second part is uh, you mentioned you're not in, you're intentionally not making the CP device as a NOVA node, like NOVA compute. Can you elaborate why you uh, went that route as opposed to making it as a NOVA node show up in a controller? Okay. So first question: uh, the number of the uh, endpoint uh, or the CP devices. It's since that and that is why we chose the control to have like a more proven scale by bringing by BGP. So basically, the virtual network uh, ha uh, will, uh, is managed and uh, connected by the BGP running in the control, uh, controller side. So that uh, it na uh, na uh, natively scales for the end endpoint perspective. So the CP device point of view. So of course, uh, like, uh, I don't know so, uh, uh, whether you already experienced like uh, having Nova uh, 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 running like uh, in the uh, NFB use cases, especially the uh, CP device like a remote device. So if you have like a Nova compute, you have to have like a secure connection to the like a RabbitMQ or like RPCs uh, server running in the data center side. And so let's say Contra has its own controller and Nova uses their own RPC channel. It doesn't make sense to uh, have multiple similar uh, mechanisms uh, for the remote site management. So uh, it needs to be more focused and simplified to s slim down the stacks that we can, uh, to, uh, to the size that we can manage in this small uh, remote site. So that like uh, we, by design, we uh, em uh, embedded all those uh, service instance creation uh, channel into the XMPP. Then like uh, we have like a more simpler stacks running in this device. Is that uh, answer to you? The, the other thing I just want to quickly add is that there is no scheduling that is being done. You know what device you are actually spinning up the VM on. So um, that, that is one, one reason why we did not need to use Nova. And of course, the V router is sitting on the CP device, so it sends back a lot of information centrally. So you have a view of your, of your uh, branch uh, environment. Can you uh, get back to the architecture slide that you had? Yeah, this one. This so, one? Uh, what is exactly the roles and responsibilities of OpenStack and uh, Open Contrail here? Okay. So, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, cool. I, I was just going uh, to say that OpenStack does VM orchestration. Open Contrail takes care of the networking part. We have a Neutron module, as I said, which exposes the standard Neutron APIs. So when Open Contrail actually calls into a Neutron API, it comes to the Neutron plugin, and then the whole environment takes over. So that I mean, th there's a clear distinction in, uh, between the networking part versus the compute orchestration and storage and other APIs. 
So are you just using OpenStack uh, just to bring up the VMs here? No. They're using uh, the so, templates? So it depends. So it's on, uh, so it will take care, uh, taken care of by, uh, by the worker. So if the user choose to run at the pop side, so pop, uh, so that pop means it will, uh, Nova will schedule to deliver the VM inside the pop for the VNF creation. So uh, then uh, when, the, uh, when the customer choose the, uh, like a ES device name or like a device group, so it will schedule to that uh, like uh, drop, drop, uh, drop the VNF image directly to uh, like ex uh, explicitly. So, uh, in, so that like uh, we use the heat layer to sometime in the DC, we use Nova. And like a ESC management, like a remote side, we directly call control API to spin up the service instance by using control API. And, and, and then Contrail in turn uh, uses um, Nova to spin up VMs. Okay. And how do you download the bootstrapping configuration? So let's say you, know, you have a specific service configured. Where do you generate this config and how do you download it? Uh, for the VNF configuration or the general like a CP configuration? Both. So uh, basically, general like a uh, uh, device configuration. So this pulls like uh, uh, the uh, controller side running in the uh, cluster, home cluster, and periodically check whether it's update or uh, the, com and then I will automatically fetch the configuration in appropriate manner, or that even the OS can be checked and updated uh, automatically here. So the VNF configuration, it's like a more top-down approach. So that, like uh, in our case, so we assume like uh, some VNF manager from a third-party vendor uh, 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 running from a third party, or we put some simple abstracted APIs like what you see today. So uh, as a platform, we are very open to have like uh, not to hide those vendor differentiators features. Customer has their own reason to select the uh, vendors and the devices for their uh, specific use cases. So our platform, it's open to have kind of like a customer can manage their own VNF directly or put some orchestrator from the product vendor side which comes with the uh, VNFs or we can add like a more simple abstraction layer by service provider. So we have three levels of the engagement of the how we manage the VNFs. Thank you. Jason, yeah, Jason schema. So Contrail yeah. is XML, yes. But so it's like a product, and our uh, like our orchestrator model is the different. So we define our service model, and write the uh, definition of how we map the service abstracted model to the product. So if you see like OpenStack, OpenCultural, lots of SaaS band products, so you see lots of uh, APIs but we don't want to expose it to our customer so that we abstract and simplify the data model and then the orchestration layer will do the very busy things for orchestrating underlying APIs. Any questions? The question is to have like a uh, what is a, um, a model of these CP devices and what the target number or saturation number of the VN, uh, VNFs. So from the ESI architecture point of view, so our software uh, can be portable on any devices uh, as a CPU or uh, like a this kind of de a small desktop form factor appliances, or having like an x86 server with a bunch of host power. So it's solution wise, it's portable. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, this model, so it's focused on like more small offices. So let's say they, for example, uh, retail uh, customers, so they don't have their own dedicated IT staff on site. So they need a more uh, like a simplified small architecture. They don't have like a use case to m spin up a bunch of VNFs. So our assumption is like a spin up couple of VMs. So since we are ha uh, selected uh, uh, atom-based processor, which has four core, and like uh, having software 
uh, forwarding process running inside. So this is sufficient for a small enterprise office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From, from, from a Contrail architecture perspective, this is just another compute node, and you can have multiple of those compute nodes where you spin up, spin up VMs on any one of them. So. OK, uh, this is now the time. So uh, any, any other questions? OK, so it's perfect. It's 2.30. Thank you very Thank much you. for attendance. <laughs>